الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى Today we're going to start the essential course with the subject Aqeedah. We're not going to do a book. It's only meant to be an introduction to Aqeedah. What does Aqeedah mean? And what are the stages and the development and the formation that Aqeedah went through? Inshallah ta'ala, the class is going to be an interaction. So in any time, if you feel that you haven't understood a point that I've said, you're more than happy, you're more than welcome, inshallah ta'ala, to ask, inshallah ta'ala. I'll be standing up a lot of the time, writing on the board, every point that I say, I will write inshallah. But I first write in Arabic. And then I'll write in English. Reason is because if I do define or translate a word and somebody here inshallah ta'ala has a better translation, we can benefit from one another inshallah. The class is going to be on these two points inshallah today. We're going to take ta'rif al-aqeedah. What does aqeedah mean? What's the definition of aqeedah? And the second inshallah ta'ala is It's going to be al asma al ukhra Other names that are given to the science Aqeedah. Is it only known as Aqeedah or does it have other names? That's all we're going to take today. Let's start with the first one, which is the definition of Aqeedah. What is the definition of Aqeedah? Understand something very important. Anything that you define, whatever it may be, there's always a linguistic definition and there's a technical definition. Remember this every single thing that is defined, there is always a linguistic definition and there is a what? A technical, a technical definition. For example, what's the linguistic definition of salah? Is there anything I know? Salah. Linguistically, not in the, in the religion. Connect. Huh? Connect. To connect. Like. Dua. Dua. The Arabs used to use this word, Salah, before the Prophet ﷺ came, before Islam came, they used to use this word, Salah. It had a meaning for them. The word Salah meant to the Arabs, supplication. It meant dua. That's the linguistic usage of the word. But when Islam came, it added things on to the definition. So it is dua, but it's not only dua. There is standing, there's rukur, there's sujood. The duas are done at a particular place. Are we all together? So this is vital to understand. Everything has a linguistic meaning and a technical meaning. So first what we're going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is we're going to take the definition of aqidah in the language. According to the Arabic language, what does the word aqidah mean? Linguistically, according to the Arabs, what do they use as the word aqidah? After following up the word aqidah, I have come to the conclusion that Aqeedah does not need four definitions. There's only four usages that the Arabs used it in. Remember this, okay? So there are four usages of the word Aqeedah in the Arabic language. We're going to go through one after the other. And it's in the notes that were given to you. The first one is, the first usage from the four usages is Ar-Rabtu. Okay, Alif Lam, 
What does Arabtu mean? It means to tie something, to make a knot. In the Arabic language, the word Aqidah, Lugat, in the Arabic language is four usages only. Four. The Arabs use it in one of these four. The first one is Arabtu, it's to tie something, tie something. When you take a rope and you tie it with another rope, the Arabs say, Lugat Aq. Same word, Are we all together? That's the first usage. That's the first usage. What's the first usage? to tie something. The second usage is Ahd. Al Ahd. What does that mean? A covenant. Allah used it in the Quran. Ya amanu awfu. Awfu bil uqud, uqud. Uqud in that ayah comes from the word aqidah. Oh, those of you who believe, fulfill the covenants that you made. So the second usage for the word aqidah in the Arabic language is what? Ahd, promise, covenant that you make is aqidah. That's the second usage according to the Arabs. That's how they use it. The third usage is al mulazama It's to be consistent with something. To be consistent in something. And continuous in something. And to not stop it. The Arabs, they use the word aqt as mulazama Continuation, consistency. That's the third usage that they use. The fourth one is a tawkid emphasis. The fourth one is a tawkid emphasis. And that's the one that's used. That's the one that is used when it comes to marriage. Act. We've just done an act in this transaction or this act in marriage. It's tawkid emphasis that you're going to fulfill your side of the promise. So according to the Arabs, aqidah means these four. Ar-Rabtu, al-Ahdu, al-Mulazama and al-Tawkid. Before we move on, does everybody understand that point? This is the Arabs, what they mean by al aqida does that make sense? Is that crystal clear to everybody? Does everyone here understand? Now we're going to move on to the second type of definition, which is what? The, the technical definition. Here we mean technical according to the Sharia. So how does the Sharia use it? The Sharia has two usages of the word al aqidah So again, this was Lugatan. And the second one is called what? Istilahan. Istilahan. Naam. Istilahan means what? Technically. According to the Sharia. What does it mean? The Sharia uses the word aqidah in a general usage and a specific usage am and khas in the sharia there's a general usage and there's a specific usage so what do we say istilahun am istilah khas the sharia uses it in two ways the language is how much four but in the Sharia, it's used in what? Two usages. The first one is general, which is am. And the second one is khas. Am means what? Aqidah is used for Islam and also aqidah is used for anything that's not Islam as well. The Buddhists, we say they're aqidah. The Christians, we say they're aqidah. The Jews, we say they're aqidah. This is the general usage. Aqidah tul- Nasara, the aqidah of the Christians. 
Aqidatul Yahud, the belief of the Jews. That's, that's the, the general usage. Are we all together? The second usage is specific to Islam. The second usage is what? It's specific to what? Specific to Al Islam. And it means the following the six articles of faith. Does everyone here know the six articles of faith? The second usage is specific to Islam. And it means the six articles of faith. And to mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawmil akhir wa tu'mina bil qadari khayrihi wa shar everyone knows here that right the six articles of faith are we all together brothers and three extra things here now what are the three extra things the issue pertaining to al iman what does iman mean and its definition are we all together that's aqidah according to the sharia. What does iman mean? When does a person become a mu'min? When does, a, when does the iman increase? What makes the iman increase? When does the iman reduce? They speak about it in books of aqidah, right? As sahaba, companions, and their status. Second one is what? As sahabas, and the companions. And that which is pertaining to them. And the third one is Al Imama, the Muslim leader, and the relationship between the people and their leader, and obeying and listening and submitting. Those three are dealt with in what? Books of Aqidah. If you study books of Aqidah, what do you learn? The six articles of faith. And to billahi, what does it mean? Wa malaikati, what does it mean? Wa kutubi, what does it mean? All the six articles of faith. Once you finish that, at the ending, they add these three to it. What does Iman mean? Al Imanu qawlun wa amalun wa atiqadun yazidu bi ta'ati wa yanqusu bil ma'asiyah. Iman is speech, it's actions. It increases and it decreases. The companions, are they all the same? Do they have different levels? How should we be towards the companions? Are the companions infallible? They don't do mistakes? Or do they do mistakes? All of that, Ahlul Sunnah, they deal with it in books of Ihtiqad. Third one is the issue of Imama, the Muslim leader. How should, should the people be towards him? What are the responsibilities that are, the people have towards him, and etc.? All three of those are also dealt in books of Aqidah. Are we all together? This is the specific type of usage. Are we all together? And the general type of usage is what? The aqeed of every belief and every group. Does that make sense? What we've now done, walillahi alhamdu wal minna, is we've what? We've defined, we fulfilled the first part of today's class, which is what? To define, it's to define aqeedah. Before we move on to the next one, which is going to be the longest one, has everybody understood? Can I, okay, repeat it. Naam. So let me say this again. Aqidah is to, its definition is linguistically and what? That's not just for Aqidah brothers. It's not specific to Aqidah only. It's anything. Everything in the Sharia that's used, any term in the Sharia that you use, there's a technical and there's also a linguistic definition for it. Are we all together? You have to know both. What's the linguistic usage? And also what's the technical usage? Well, Idarika, the scholars, they say, to place a ruling on something, what do you first have to do? You have to know the things. You have to know the definition of that thing. Al-hukmu ala shay, far'un, far'un an tasawurihi. To place a ruling on something, first of all, you have to know what it is. Are we all together? How can you say my aqidah is right if you don't know what aqidah means? 
You have to know what it means. What's his definition? What does aqidah want from you? What do you study in aqidah? What is the difference between aqidah and fiqh? Are we all together? So aqidah, you have to understand it linguistically, and you also have to understand it technically. It's not enough to know it linguistically. You have to know when the sharia came, it used that word, but what did it mean by it? It's important that you understand it. So, we found that linguistically the word aqidah, it means four things. Arrabtu, which means to tie something. To get a rope, tie it. That tying that you're doing is called aqd. Number two, al-ahd. Ahd is a covenant and a promise that you're making. Al-mulazimah means what? To be consistent and continuous with something, right? And the third, fourth one is what? Consistent and continuation. Who can see a pattern that's here? There's a pattern here. The pattern is, aqidah was used linguistically in two meanings, really. Something that's ma'nawi. I don't want to go too, too heavy. I just want to show you something very important and something which is hissi. What does it mean? To tie something is tangible. Something you can see, right? Somebody ties something in front of you, can you not see it? Can you not touch it? So it's something you can touch, it's tangible. Can you touch a covenant and a promise that a person made? So this is ma'nawi, but it's tying a promise. All of them are tying something. Are we all together? But some are tangible, some are not tangible. Mulazimah means you're connecting yourself to somebody or something. You're tying yourself to something. It's not tangible. Are we all together? A tawkid emphasis, you're tying a promise and a, that you're going to stick to this contract that you're making with this person. But again, it's not tangible. Are we all together? So, the only one that's hissy is a rabd. And the other four are some things that you're tying, but they are not tangible. Are we all together? But well, is some of the Aymatul Lugha, like Ibn Faris and others in his kitab, Mu'jab Maqayisul Lugha, it's a big dictionary book. He only says that it's only these usage, either hissi or ma'nawi. That's a side benefit. Then we said, technically, technically, the word aqidah means a general usage and a what? A specific usage. So a general and a, a specific. The general usage, I said it means the belief of every group. It's the belief of every group. Whatever any group believes, that's the aqidatul budiya, aqidatul nasara, aqidatul yahud. Whatever somebody believes, the aqidah. That's the general usage. But there's a specific usage. Like today when you were coming here and you were saying to yourself, I'm going to study aqidah, you were talking about the general usage or the specific usage? A specific usage. You mean aqidah to Islam I'm learning. Sah? And it means these six. So the articles of faith, which is Atumina Billahi wa Malaikati wa Kutubihi wa Rusulihi wa Yomil Akhir wa Tumina Bil Qadari Khairi wa Shari. You study that in the aqidah. What does it mean to believe in Allah? What does it actually mean to believe in the angels? What does it mean to believe in the books? What does it actually mean to believe in the messengers? The day of judgment. What does it mean to believe in the qada and the qadr? The good of it and the bad of it. What does it actually mean? You study that in the books of Aqidah. Are we all together? Once the scholars, they finish talking about that, this is called mulhaq. Mulhaq means they connect it to the ending of books of Aqidah. The reason why they did that, the scholars, is because they were coming out groups, so they wanted to explain the creed in which the Prophet was upon, and the companions to stay away from these people who are coming. So the issue of Iman, the first deviated group came, the Khawarij. So the scholars and the companions and every they had to explain what Iman means. Because they were taking the people out of the religion straight away. And they were saying you're not a believer, you're a disbeliever. So the scholars and the people of knowledge they they said, Okay, you know what? Iman needs to be defined. And when does a person exit Iman? Are we all together? And then the Shia came regarding the companions. So then scholars wrote books on 
the companions and their status. And then Imama, the Mu'tazila came, who wanted to go against the leader. If he'd done anything, go against it, uprise. So they wrote books. Are we all together? All of that was caught up on the books of Itiqad because groups were coming. Does that make sense? Are we all on the same page? So this is Aqeedah. And this is any book of Aqeedah that you open, that's what, that's what you're going to study from it. These six, with these three, how much does that make? Nine points of Itiqad that you study. Are we all together, brothers? Can we now move on to the second point? Yeah? Has everyone understood? Are we all, to, are we all on the same page? Does any, anyone have any question? No one. Are you all sure? Because oh, I'm going to ask questions later. Okay. Now we're going to go into what part now? We've, Alhamdulillah, we've defined aqidah, logatan, wastilahat, linguistically and what? And technically. We're now going to move on to this subject is not only known as aqidah. It's not known only as oh, it's got other names. So we're now going to move on. Other names given to aqidah. Before I move on, there's three points that are very relevant that I have to mention. Are we all together? One. Point number one. This is important points. So you just write this as what? Three important points. Number one. Aqeedah as to mean those six points that we mentioned here and those nine is not used in the Quran. Nor is it used in the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah use the word Aqeedah linguistically only. Only those four points. Four, four that we said Are we all together? So the word Aqeedah In the Quran And in the Sunnah It didn't use it as The six articles of faith And the, nine, and the other three that we mentioned The nine that we just mentioned The nine that I mentioned here Do you remember? The Quran didn't use it like that Nor did the Sunnah The Quran only used it Linguistic meaning. Are we all together? Either al rabtu which was the first one that we mentioned, or al ahdu or al tawkid or al mulazama. So you won't find aqida that term in the Quran, nor would you find that term in the Sunnah. In that way, that's point number one. I'm coming to a point, inshallah. I want you to understand. Point number two. The Sahabas and the Tabi'een and the Tabi'u Tabi'een did not use that term, Aqeedah, like that. So the Sahabas didn't, the Tabi'een didn't, and the Tabi'u Tabi'een didn't. So that's the second point. The third point is, who was the first to use it? Yeah? The first person to use it was the noble Imam Abu Hatim al-Razi, rahimahullah. And Imam Abu Hatim al-Razi, who died the year 320 something, he was the first person to coin this term Aqeedah as to mean the belief and the core articles of faith for the believer. And then after him came great Imams like Abu Qasim Hibatullah al lalakaiyu Al Imam Abu Qasim al Taymiyu in his Kitab al Hujja fi Bayan al Mahajja. And also Al-Imam Al-Bayhaqi. You have all of that written on your notes. It's all written for you. They came. And what did they, what did they do? They used that term. And ever since after that, the term Aqeedah was used in that way. Does everybody understand this? The Quran like he uses another term and the Sunnah uses another term which is the term Al-Iman. The Quran and the Sunnah uses what term? Al-Iman Now I want you to understand the point Scholars they say La mushahata La mushahata fi 
It's not a problem if you ignore the word aqeed and you use the word iman la bas, because they both mean the same. The reality is, is what's after it. Are we all together? You don't get closer to Allah by the term aqeedah. Okay? What is it that the scholars want from it, Lakin? It's the, in your heart, what are you connecting? Because remember the word aqeed, what does it mean? It's what you connect in your that tying that you're doing, that rabt, you're tying your heart, a belief. That's all that matters to them. The term, ignore it if you want to. Use iman if you want. But what the concept behind it is what they're looking at. Are we all together? Does that make sense? That's important. You won't find some terms in the sharia, but the scholars used it min babi taqrib to get it close to you. Sah? If you study grammar, you study mubtada, khabar, fi'il, fa'il. You're not going to find that in the Quran or on the sunnah, are you? But it's to get a science close to you. That's, that's an important point that I want you to all understand, inshallah ta'ala. Let's now go on to the second point, which is al-asma'il ukhra al-muradifati al-ilm al-aqeedah. Are there names that are given to ilm al-aqeedah that the scholars gave? Other names that the scholars that the scholars gave. The first one is at tawheed. The first one is what? It's at tawheed. What does tawheed actually mean? It comes from the verbal noun. The verbal noun in Arabic which is Wahada. Wahada. Yuwahidu. Comes from that word. Wahada. Yuwahidu. Tawheedan. Comes from that verbal noun of Wahada. Yuwahidu. Tawheedan. Does that make sense? That's the root word that it comes from. What does it mean? To make Allah one. That's what it means. Linguistic. It means, sorry, linguistically, what does it mean? It means one. To make something one. That's what it means in the Arabic language. For example, sorry, before I go, Tawheed stands on two pillars. What does it stand on? Two pill pillars. Without these two pillars, this is not called Tawheed. If one of those pillars are missing, this is not called a Tawheed. What is it? Isbat and Nafi. What does Isbat and Nafi mean? It means negation and affirmation. Negation and what? Ma dakhala illa Zaid. No one entered except Zaid. Oh, uh, sorry. This is yeah, back. This is negation and this is affirmation. Okay. I was just testing you guys. Isbat is what? <laughs> Isbat is affirmation, and nafi is negation to negate something. These are the two pillars that it stands on. In other words, what we're saying in Tawheed is what? Ibadah, worship, it's for nobody. That's the negation. Hey, except Allah affirmation. You see that? So you can't just say, worship is for Allah. That's just affirmation. Worship is for Allah is not Tawheed. You haven't still come with Tawheed. What do you have to say? Worship is not for anyone except Allah. You have to negate it from everything else and then affirm it for who? For Allah. Does that make sense? Those are the two pillars it stands on. Nafyun wa ithbat. Ithbat means affirmation and nafy means negation. Now the question here is, what is it that we single Allah with? Can we single Him? That's no doubt. Negate everything else and we specify something for him. But what is it that we negate from other things and we only specify for him? What is it that we give to him alone? 
هي ها أه؟ واشب هي اذا ايه لوشب هي اذا ايه three things the scholars they say when we're affirming something for Allah alone him alone no one else they say three things number one is what you are singling Allah in the actions that Allah does Allah has actions he does things he creates he provides he sustains those actions that he does Allah Azza wa Jal what do we do we single him in it. We don't give it to anyone. Allah is the only creator. Allah is the only sustainer. Allah is the only provider. We're singling Allah in what? Uh, not worship. Lordship. We're, I want to make it easy because some people don't even understand the term lordship or rububiyah. They don't understand it. It's singling Allah in the actions Allah does. Does that make sense? That's the first one. Which in simple terms is called rububiyah. Rububiyah means Allah's actions. What does rububiyah mean? The actions Allah does subhanahu wa ta'ala. We single him in it. We don't give that actions to anyone. That's rububiyah. The second one is what? Al-uluhiyah. What's uluhiyah? The actions that you do. You create, you makhluk, you the created one. You're singling Allah in your actions. Which is when you pray, who do you pray for? Only Him. When you fast, who do you fast for? Only Him. When you slaughter, who do you slaughter for? Only Him. You single Allah in what? In your actions. What you do. You don't associate partners with Him in that. That's the what? That's the second. What's the third? Allah has names and He has attributes. You don't give anyone those names that he has. Ar-Rahman is his name. The characteristics that's in it is what? Ar-Rahma, mercy. There's no one who's merciful like Allah Azza wa Jal. Are we all together? And the third one is Allah's names and attributes. These are the three that you do to Hidden. One more time. In the actions that Allah does, his rububiyyah, you single him in it. If somebody asks you, who creates? Allah alone creates. Who sustains? Allah alone sustains. Who provides? Allah alone provides. Who governs and controls the universe? Allah alone does. صح? That's singling Allah in what? In the actions that He does, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second part is what? The actions that you come with. If you've now affirmed Allah is the only one who created you, Allah is the only one who provides for you, Allah is the one who sustains you, now worship him alone then. Are we all together? Am I making sense here? Worship him alone. وَلِذَلِكَ This is where Kuffar of Quraysh and Nabi Allah Muhammad This is where everything went separate. Kuffar of Quraysh singled Allah in the actions Allah does. They did that. They said Allah is the creator. Huh? Allah, yeah he's the sustainer. Allah is the only provider. But when they were told, okay, worship him alone, they will say, no. No, 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 we're not, we're not, we're not. Are we all together, brothers? So they didn't come with uluhiyah. That's what they didn't come with. Sahih? Are you all together, brothers? The third one is what? Allah has names. He has names. And each name, every single name, there is a characteristic in it. Each name, there is a what? Each name, there is a, there's a characteristic in it. Jazakallah khairan. Pay attention to that. Allah, how many names do we know that He has? See how I asked that question. I didn't say, how many names does Allah have? I said, how many names of Allah do we know that He has? 99 is what we know. Those are not only His names. It's got more than that. But these are the 99 that we know. Each of those 99 are not just names. What are they? Characteristics are in it. Ar-Rahman has a characteristics in it. What's the characteristics in it? Ar-Rahman is merciful. So we affirm the name and the attribute for him. And we single him in it. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does everybody understand this? Has everyone understood this? Now we've understood the first name 
That's a synonym of aqidah. What is it? A tawheed. Do we now know what tawheed means? I'm going to now mention books that are written in tawheed. Classic books, okay. From those books are, again it's in your notes inshallah ta'ala, is the kitab written by Ibn Manda. Ibn Manda has a kitab called Kitab al-Tawheed. And he means by it aqidah. Ibn Khuzayma has a kitab called what? Ibn Khuzayma. Ibn Khuzayma has a kitab called Kitab al-Tawheed. He is using the name Tawheed, but what does he mean? Aqidah. It's a synonym. It's interchangeably used. You can call it Tawheed if you want. You can call it Aqidah if you want. Are we all together? What's the second name that is given to Tawheed? Uh, sorry, Aqidah. The second name that is used for Aqidah, Usul al-Din. The term Usul al-Din is used. So the second name is what? Usul Usul al-Din is also a, a term used for Aqidah. What is it used for? It's used for Aqidah. So some scholars, they don't call it Aqidah. They call it Usul al-Din. Some scholars, what do they call it? Tawheed. And some people, scholars, what do they call it? So if you hear Aqidah, Tawheed and Usul al-Din, they are interchangeably used. What are they? They're all used. If you say I'm now studying Tawheed, no problem. If you say I'm studying Aqidah, no problem. If you say I'm studying Usul al-Din, no problem. It means the same. Usul al-Din is compounded of two words. One, which is Usul, and the second is what? Deen. Usul is ma yubna alayhi ghayru. It's a foundation. Whatever is built upon it. So usul means foundation. Ad deen, what does it mean? Huh? Deen means? What does deen mean? Huh? It means religion. That's technically. What does it linguistically mean? Huh? Huh? Way, deen. Hey, who, 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 any other? What does deen mean linguistically? Faith. Huh? Faith, that's technically, linguistically. Recompense, linguistically, nope. Huh? Islam, that's, ling- that's technically. Remember, everything has a. Arabs were using the word deen before the word Islam came. So, what do they mean? Deen comes from the word khudu' Dan al ardu the Arabs would say. Mama'ana dan al ardu the earth humbled itself when it was walked on. Are you with me? And then the word deen, linguistically according to the Arabs, what does it mean? Khudu' to humble, soften, huh? humility, humbleness. That's what it linguistically meant according to the Arabs. So when you become a Muslim, what do you do? Submission, right? That's what it means. Does that make sense? Again, brothers, I really ask of you all, every term that you see, look for the linguistic and the technical meaning. It's important. Sah? Give time. What does it mean linguistically? What were the Arabs saying before this? And now that the Sharia came, what did it call it? Are we all together? You'll start to learn a lot. Like in the Sharia, what does it mean? Ta'atu fi ma amar. Ta'atu fi ma amar. Following Allah, everything which He commanded you to do. And wajtinabu ma naha anhu wa zajar. And stay away from that which He prohibited you. And to believe in everything He informed you. Those are the three. Obeying Him in what He told you to do. Staying away from what He told you to stay away from. And believing in everything He told you. That's what Islam means. I mean, that's what deen means to us. That's a side point. So again, the word usulu deen is the second thing that's used for aqidah. We mentioned tawheed. We're now mentioning what? Usulu deen is compounded of what? 
two words. The first one is what? Usul. The singular is what? Asal. Usul is plural. Asal is singular. What does asal mean? Foundation. What does deen mean? Three things. Just told you right now. What does deen mean? Three things. Following everything Allah commanded you to do. Allah told you to do this. Okay. The second one is stay away from everything Allah told you to stay away from. The third one is believing in everything Allah told you. Allah told you about day of judgment. You haven't seen it yet. Believe it. Allah told you about angels. You haven't seen it. Believe it. Allah told you what has already happened about Musa and Fir'aun existed. Believe it. That's what deen means. You come with those three. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Now we're going to move on. To, who was the first to use the word usulu deen? And say it's called aqidah means usulu deen. They say the first to use it was Imam al-Shafi'i. Rahimahullah. They say Imam al-Shafi'i was the first. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The last one that we're going to take, inshallah ta'ala, before we go for the question and answers, is the third one today we're going to take is sunnah. What are we going to say? The third one is sunnah. Sunnah is used at aqidah. Before I move on sunnah, I forgot to mention books that are written in usul al-deen with that title. Al-Ibana, written by Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari, and also Al-Ibana, al-Sughra, written by who? Ibn Battah al-Akburi It's in your notes, right? Is all of this not on your notes? Huh? The answers we're going to The whole point is To discuss the answers inshallah ta'ala Lakin The kitab is Al-Usul al-Deen Written by Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari He has a kitab called Al-Ibana Fi Usul al-Diyana Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari. So he used the term, Usul al-Din. Who also used it? A scholar by the name of Ibn Battah al-Akburi, rahimahullah, al Akburi, rahimahullah. He also has a book on, on the term Usul al-Din. He has a kitab called Al-Ibana as well, and Usul al-Diyana, like Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari, same name. But it's well known as Ibana al sughra Also, Abu Hatim al-Razi, there's a kitab called Usul al-Sunnati wa Diyana, which is known as Aqidat al-Raziyain. Okay. Has everyone understood that? We're now going to move on to the last one today, inshallah ta'ala, that we need to know, which is interchangeably used a synonym of what? Al-Aqidah. What is it? Al-Sunnah. The term Al-Sunnah is used as Aqidah. Again, MashaAllah Mubarak, who knows what Sunnah means linguistically? Hayya? Fadala. It means way, good. Any other person know any other word? Path. That's correct. Tariq, path, naam. Huh? A tradition, MashaAllah Mubarak. We have two, hey? Huh? Guidance. The Arabs, when they use the word Sunnah fil Lugha in the language three usage, Sunnah means linguistically according to the Arabs before Islam came, three meanings. The first one is At Tariqatul Masluka, the path that's taken. At Tariqatul Masluka, the path that you take or a path is called Sunnah. A Sunnah is called a path. That's one. We've heard it, Allah Mubarak. The second one is a seerah. A person's biography is their sunnah. Sunnah is seerah, biography. Are we all together? Seerah, biography, linguistically is sunnah. Third one is, as our brother mentioned over there, al-'adatu allati la tatakhallaf. If something happens and it never changes and this is what's always happening, this is a sunnah. As Allah said in the Quran, Sunnah Allah. 
This is the sunnah of Allah, he doesn't change it. It's the way that Allah does things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he talks about how he destroys nations, when they disobey him. When Allah spoke about the prophets, what did he say? Sunnah man qad. This is the sunnah of what? Those who came before. So when a nation go against Allah's command and they disobey Allah, what does Allah do? He brings a punishment. This is the sunnah of Allah, we say. I mean, this is the norms and the things that norms. Those are the three meanings that the Arabs use the word as sunnah. Does that make sense? The first one was what? al tariqatul masluka. Second one is what? al sirah Third one is al adah Allati la tatakhallaf wa la tatabaddal. Which one in, in Arabic? So now we've learned the word sunnah linguistically. What does it mean technically? Ooh, this is a problem now. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Sunnah is used technically by different scholars of different fields. Are we all together? The scholars in the religion are different fields, right? Different fields. Like the scholars who deal with fiqh. When they use the word sunnah, they mean what? The opposite of wajib. Meaning, you don't really have to do it. As a lot of us know it as. You don't really have to do it. So if somebody comes up to you and says, this is sunnah, oh Allah, barik. so I don't have to do it. That one is according to only one group of scholars who mean that. Who is it? Huh? The fuqaha. The jurists, when they say sunnah, and you're reading a fiqh book. And brothers, this is very important. Based on learning the definition of words, when you open a particular science, you know what these people mean it. Are we all together? It's one word. Sunnah means different in different sciences. So when you're reading fiqh, what do you need to do? understand? That fiqh means something to these people. But you're reading an aqidah book, and the word sunnah is mentioned. Are you going to say it's the opposite of wajib? It's not the opposite of wajib. Are we all together? So it's important that you learn definition of words. Well, one of the biggest reasons by why people become corrupt is because of not defining a term correctly. And we're living at a time when terms need to be defined first before a discussion is opened. What's the definition of that word according to you? Are we all together? So sunnah linguistically means something and then istilah and technically each scholar of different sciences they define it differently the scholars who deal with fiqh halal and haram they use the word sunnah as to be the opposite of what? wajib the opposite of obligation meaning they say that sunnah means if you do it you get rewarded and if you leave it you will not get punished does that make sense? That's according to the fuqaha. Like in according to the scholars of i'tiqad and the scholars of aqidah, the story is different. They mean the opposite of bid'ah. The opposite of what? Innovation. They mean the opposite of what? Innovation. So when a books of aqidah, when you read, this is a sunnah, they mean, this is the way the Prophet did it. And anything other than this is an innovation. Not that you can do it. No, you can't. Are we all together? So, again. Fuqaha, sunnah is the opposite of what? Wajib. Scholars of aqidah, the sunnah is the opposite of what? Bid'ah. Another, another group of scholars, they're called the usuliyin. Those who deal with a subject called usulul fiqh. What are they called? 
Usuliyin. They deal with a topic called Usulul Fiqh. When they say Sunnah, they mean Masdar Taraqi. Where do you take your religion from? As in Quran and Sunnah and Ijma' and Qiyas al Sahih. They mean Masdar Taraqi. Where you take your religion from? Usuliyin use the word Sunnah in that context. Where you take your religion from. Does that make sense? Scholars of fiqh, they refer to it as anything that's opposite to wajib. And the scholars of aqidah, sunnah is the opposite of what? Bid'ah. Does that make sense? Well, idhalika, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, alaykum bi sunnati upon you is my sunnah. What does he mean here? Does he mean the only voluntary things that we need to do? The Prophet used the word sunnah. What did he say? Alaykum. Alaykum bi sunnati. No, he means my speech, my actions are upon you. My way of life, the way I was is upon you. Are we all together? And what I believed, you have to believe. Does that make sense? We've now, inshallah ta'ala, tackled these points. Now, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to take questions from you all. Fadl, what's the question? Usuliyin is the Mazdaru Talaqi. Mazdaru Talaqi means what? The source in which you take your religion from. Where do we take our religion from when we're. Only? Four places we take our religion from, right? Quran, Al Kitabu, and then As Sunnah, and Al Ijma' consents, and Al Qiyas, As Sahih. Qiyas Sahih. Al Kitab, As Sunnah, Al Qiyas, Al Qiyas. So when the Usuliyin say As Sunnah, what do they actually mean? They mean one of the places that you take your religion from. One of the four places which you take your religion from. Are we all together? Is dhuhr wajib? Yeah? Is dhuhr obligatory? Do you have to pray dhuhr? Do we have to pray dhuhr? What about, is there a difference of opinion on this issue? Huh? So there's the ijma'ah. No one can go against it. No one can come and say, I looked at the Quran and it doesn't clearly show that dhuhr is wajib or not. We say, this mas'ala is mujma'un alayh. Consent. Min laddun sahaba From the time of the companion till today, there's a unanimous agreement that Salat al-Dhuhr is wajib and that you have to pray. Are we all together? So Ijma' closes the door of anyone saying, I looked at the Quran and I looked at the Sunnah and for me it doesn't seem that way. No, no, no. Once there comes a consent, there's no path open for you. Are we all together? Because Allah said, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيَرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمُ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا But that's another discussion. We're not studying usul al-fiqh or fiqh right now. We're studying aqidah. Any other question? Aqidah. <laughs> so what did we say aqidah? What does it actually mean? It means to connect and believe in your heart Allah, the angels, the six articles of faith and the three that we mention here that you tie these concepts in your heart how the scholars of Ahl-Sunnah documented it in their books Are we all together? which they took from the Quran and the, and the Sunnah Say that again According According to the scholars of Atiqad, Sunnah means Atiqad. It means belief. That's it. Wherever you st- those six articles and the three for them, that's Sunnah. According to the scholars of Aqidah. Walidarika, you have a kitab called Kitab Sunnah by who? Khalal. You have a Kitab Sunnah by who? Imam Al Barbahari, Sharh Al Sunnah. Imam Ahmed, Rahimah Al Usul Al Sunnah. You have Kitab Al Sunnah by his son Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Are you with me? Sarih al-Sunnah by Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. 
So you have Kitab Sunnah, and all of it is Aqidah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Opposite to Bidah. So if they say this is Sunnah, they mean if you don't, if you do opposite to this, you're falling into innovation. Are we all together? In other words, when the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, "Satafariqu ummati ala thalathi wa sabiina firqa," my ummah will be divided into seventy-three sects, seventy-three groups. Kulluha fi nari. All of the groups are in the hellfire, illa wahida except except one. The companions they said, "Qala man hiya Rasool Allah." Who's this one group that's going to be saved? The statements that came from the Prophet ﷺ, one narration says that he said, "Al Jama'ah," the group. What did he say? The group. The scholars, they ask, who were the group that day? Him and his companions. Another riwayah explains that. What did he say? Man kana ala mithli ma ana alayhi liyom wa ashabi. Anyone who's upon that which I and my companions are upon. So what I'm upon means my sunnah and the sunnah of my rightly guided khulafa and companions. So if you want to be saved, you don't have to be from a particular country, from a particular background, you don't have to look in a particular way. All that is needed from you is to be upon the way that the Prophet was upon and the companions were upon. You don't have to sign a contract somewhere. You don't have to be part of a particular group and have a particular name or dress in a particular way. None of that. All that is needed from you is to be upon the way that the Prophet was and his what? And his companions. And then the scholars, when they aqidah, they mean that sunnah. That way is the sunnah. And anything other than that is innovation. Does that make sense? Has everyone understood that point? And then when ulama al aqida say sunnah, they mean the Prophet's way and his companion's way, that's sunnah. Anything other than that, what is it? Innovation. Anything other than that is newly invented matters. Sahih? So manhaj, is it the same as the word aqidah? Or are they interchangeably used? Huh? Ah, manhaj and aqidah, are they both the same? Scholars, they say that i'tiqad, aqidah and manhaj are synonyms that can be used interchangeably. But it's also a difference as well. The difference is aqidah is the theoretical side and manhaj is the practicality now. The applying of what you learn. Does that make sense? So, aqidah is what? The theory. Because all of these six that we mentioned, they're all beliefs in your heart. And the three that we mentioned, what are they? Concepts that you believe. Theory. So take the theories in. Manhaj is now you apply. Hey, fadl. Go apply the aqidah that you learned. Apply in what way? By respecting the companions. Let's see you respect it. Are you with me? At-taraddi an sahaba Radiyallahu anhu. That's manhaj. The applying what you learnt. So it's not just theory. But it's what? That application they call it manhaj. Does that make sense? Even the word tawheed. Even though it's interchangeably used with aqidah, there's also a difference as well. There's a difference. How many articles of faith did we just say right now there were? What's the first one? Tawheed is only that one. And Tu'mina Billah is only Tawheed. And Aqid is the, the, all of them, all the six together. Are you with me? So which one's more holistic? Aqidah and Tawheed is specific. But they also can be used interchangeably. Because there's a Qa'idah which is إِذَا اجْتَمَعَا إِفْتَرَقَا وَإِذَا اِفْتَرَقَا اِجْتَمَعَا But we don't want to go into that right now. It's too much, okay? We don't want to go into that. We just want to know Tawheed and Aqidah mean the same. Maybe inshallah ta'ala in our next levels we'll study the differences. Let's first of all know that they're the same for now. Does that make sense? It'll be beneficial for you because knowing the books, even if you don't memorize it, to note it down will help you in the future. If you want to look into this issue more, you will always know where to go to. It will always benefit you. At least to know one or two books that are written in this particular name is very good. Are you all? Huh? 
Ha, how did the muhadithun? I slipped my mind. Barakallah feek. The muhadithun, they define it as ma udifa ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min qawlin aw fi'lin aw taqreerin aw sifatu khuluqiyya aw khilqiyya. Anything that's attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of speech, action, ma udifa ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speech, ma udifa ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qawlin, aw fi'lin action, aw sifa, or characteristics. Whether those characteristics are two types, the way Allah created them. The way that the Prophet used to walk according to the Muhadithin as Sunnah. The way he used to eat. The way that when he would speak to somebody, he would turn his whole body. And the Prophet never, never talk to somebody from the corner of his head. Some people, when they talk to you, they look at you and say, okay. If Nabi Allah Muhammad was talking to somebody, he would move fully and look at the person, and then he would talk to them. According to the scholars of Hadith, this is a Sunnah. Are we all together? If the Prophet was fascinated with something, قَلَّبَ كَفَّيْهِ He would always turn his hands around like this. This is a sunnah according to the who? Scholars of hadith. Are we all together? Also his manners. And how he carried himself. According to scholars of hadith, what is this? It's a sunnah. So you see, each subject, each people, they define something different. Fuqaha they define it as مَا يُثَابُ فَاعِلُهُ وَلَا يُعَاقَبُ عَلَى تَرْكِيَ The person who does it gets rewarded and if he leaves it he doesn't get punished. Sunnah means voluntary as we call it. It's a synonym of what? Nawafil. Voluntary act. Like the sunnah before Fajr. We call it sunnah before Fajr, right? Because you don't have to pray it. But it's highly recommended. That's the, when we say sunnah before fajr, what language, who, whose usage are we using right now? Fuqaha. We're talking about the fuqaha. Are we all together? But if somebody says to you, for example, it's a sunnah to eat with your right hand, what do they mean by that? Huh? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is it voluntary to eat with your right hand? Do you have to eat with your right hand? I don't understand what sunnah that I just used here according to the what? I'm using the according to the muhadithun. I'm not using the according to the fuqaha. Are we all together? Pay attention to that. Well, the some people they hear it and they say sunnah. Oh, Allah barik, I don't have to do it. Ha ha ha. Ha. They all believe it's a source of legislation. They don't deny it. What's the four categories? The sunnah. The Usuliyin, the Fuqaha, and the scholars of Aqidah. It's for all of them. Or all of them, yes. Uh, all of them, yes. All see as a source of evidence, Sahih. But the scholars of Aqidah will not be talking about Sunnah as a source of legislation. They're already, that's not their discussion now. If you want to talk about whether it's a source of legislation, you talk about that in Usul Fiqh. You get it? Scholars of Aqidah, you've already accepted it as a source of legislation. Hmm. Salam. When we're sitting together, it's not from the Sunnah to say Salam Alaikum. Because we're all here together. We were together. We was, salam is for when somebody comes in and somebody leaves. Or it's the first time I'm seeing somebody. Or an object gets between me and you while we're walking. Then to see me again, you say, Salaam Alaikum. But in a gathering, we're all together. If you come in, you say, Salaam Alaikum. But if you're sitting somewhere, it's not from the Sunnah to say, Salaam Alaikum. Sunnah meaning here, it's a? It's a what? No, it's a bid'ah. It's an innovation to do it. When you meet somebody, it's not your job to test them. You want to test people when you meet them. And uh, note down their aqidah. What do you believe regarding this? This is not your job to test people. 
The asal for the Muslim, the person, is that they're free from criticism. The asal is salama. Sahih. al baraatul asliya. You judge the person bima zahara lana, that which he brings out to you. Are we all together? But you do have the rights when you're studying with somebody. And now that you want to take knowledge from that person. We're not talking about the general mass. We're talking about a person you want to take knowledge from. You have the right, as a student, to ask that person aqidah related questions. In order to know that you're taking your religion from a pure source. But you don't say that to a person you just met in a cafe shop and you're sitting or you meet them in a the mall and you ask them aqidah related questions. Are we all together? As for the person that you're taking knowledge from, you have the right to ask them aqidah related question because of the statement of the Salaf. In هذا الأمر دين فانظروا عمن تأخذون دينكم You don't want to take your, the wrong concepts into your religion. So you have the right to ask it, but you have to watch the way that you ask. And the person should be more than happy to answer your questions. He should be what? Facilitating and more than happy to answer your questions. You shouldn't be worried to answer it. Walidarika, the scholars were before asked about their aqidah and they would write books. And Imam al Muzani, the great Shafi'i scholar, he wrote his kitab, Sharh al Sunnah, when he was asked about his aqidah. He didn't hesitate. He wrote straight away. He said, This is my belief. Are we all together? And Imam al Tahawi, rahimahullah, Imam al Tahawi, the great scholar, he wrote, He's not only his aqidah, but aqidah of his imams. Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani and Abu Hanifa. He said, This is the belief that they held, and this is the belief I hold. Are we all together? The asal is when it comes to issue of ibadat, when it comes to matters of worshipping Allah and getting close to Allah, the asal is you're not allowed to do it unless you have evidence. Does that make sense? If it's an act of worship, you're not allowed to do it unless you have what? Evidence. That's the default position. Because why? Ibadah is based on two things. Something Allah loves and is what? Pleased with why are you doing this? Because Allah loves it and Allah is pleased with it. How do you know Allah loves this and how, Allah, how do you know Allah is pleased with this? If you don't have an evidence for it. Only Allah can tell you I love this and I'm pleased with this. صح? So when it comes to matters of ibadah, what do you need? Evidence. Are we all together? What do you need? Evidence. So when you do something, say, my evidence is this. Allah said this and the messenger said this. Does that make sense? So the person who does an act of worship, he needs to provide the evidence. The opposite is when it comes to worldly issues. The worldly issues, the default position is that you can't do it unless proven otherwise. If me and you are walking in the middle of the desert, and we see an animal that we've never seen, it's got five eyes. First time we've ever seen it. The default position is that we can eat it. Unless you bring an evidence that I can't eat it. Does that make sense? Huh? This is called istishab. بِقَاءَ مَا كَانَ عَلَى مَا عَلَى مَا كَانَ When it comes to business, what's the asal? Business trading. What's the, the asal is permissible. A business trading, the asal is that it's permissible and you can do this kind of trading and the person who says to you, it's haram, you can't buy this or you can't sell this, they have to bring the evidence. They shouldn't send you the evidence and send you homework. No, you say to them, you've now said it's haram, bring the evidence. لكن the ibadat the acts of worship is the opposite. You're not allowed to do it unless you bring an evidence. Does that make sense? So can you please repeat the uh, uh, Repeat the one question one more time. Can you make the point uh, clear? Which clear? Which point? In terms of uh, religion, what is the base of the, the point? Ah. The qaida is al aslu fil ibadat al tawakuf. Ama al aslu fil ibadat al hadar. The asal in ibadat is that you're not allowed to do it. Meaning, 
you can't do something in the religion unless you have evidence for it. If it's something you want to get closer to Allah by, you have to have evidence for it. Does that make sense? The evidence is قَالَ Allah, قَالَ Rasul. Allah said and His Messenger said. صح? As for worldly issues, worldly issues, you are allowed to marry whoever you want. You are allowed to buy and sell whatever you want. You are allowed to eat whatever you want. All of these are permissibility unless proven otherwise. Are you with me? You can eat what type of food you like. If somebody comes up to you and says to, me, says to you, pork is haram, you have to say, what's your evidence? And then he has to bring you the ayah and says to you, khamar, khinzir, all of them are haram. When he brings the evidence, you say, Sama'na wa ata'ana, I hear and I obey. Does that make sense? So sunnah here means aqidah. It's outside the aqidah, but that's the, the linguistic meaning of seerah. So in other words, yes, anyone who goes against the sunnah, according to, according to the scholars of aqidah, naam, he's out of the way of the Prophet ﷺ. He's upon innovation. According to the scholars of aqidah, naam. But not according to the fuqaha. Fuqaha is you can leave the sunnah if you want to. Shall we stop here, inshaAllah ta'ala? Oh, very big, yes, naam. No. Ha- I think we have another class, right? Ah, last question here. kind of issues inshallah ta'ala as you can all see we're now starting a madhal an introduction right a plan is to do an overview these are issues inshallah ta'ala that will be tackled more in related to a particular book if we're studying it does that make sense if we come to a particular book and we come to these masail these particular issues we'll bring the evidence we'll discuss it we'll go through it in more details i don't want to take away from it by mentioning a answer now, but it doesn't suffice properly because we haven't taken in a we haven't taken in a particular book. The point for this right now isn't to study aqidah. We're not studying aqidah. Are we studying aqidah? No. We're doing a overview of aqidah. What does it mean? What are the books that are written in it? How did it form format? What stages did it go through? So later, when we study aqidah book, you understand very well. What the subject deal with, deals with. Does that make sense? And last but not least, the ultimate goal of aqidah is that what we all want at the end of the day is that Allah takes everybody to what? To Jannah. Our goal is that Allah guides and gives everybody a place in what? Jannah. Our goal is not that we make it to Jannah. And everybody else, you know, you're destroyed and you're from the deviated group. That's not our aim. Does that make sense? So when you learn these aqidah points, your biggest effort and your goal is to take the best approach in making sure that you install, these, install this information in the best of way. Some people have grown up not studying aqidah in their entire life. And if you just come in a wise way to explain these points, some people are willing to take it. They've never studied it. They've never heard of it. And if you come and you explain it calmly and collectively, and you bring these points with the evidence, inshallah ta'ala, which you'll see, they're more than happy to take it. They're what? They're more than happy to take it.